أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I begin in the name of the Almighty God, the Compassionate, the Merciful. The one who has created everything in utmost perfection. And may the peace and blessings of the Almighty God be upon his pure and beloved messenger. The peak of his creation. The symbol of humanity. The Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. And his immaculate progeny of the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, especially the leader of our time, the awaited Savior, Al Imam Al Mahdi, Ajalallahu Ta'ala Farajah. May Allah hasten his reappearance and make us all amongst his sincere and dedicated servants. Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. I sincerely welcome you to our program this evening as we discuss a very important dimension in our lives. And that is how do we speak to the opposite gender? In the first half of our presentation, we'll examine how to speak to the opposite gender in general. And then in the second half, We'll examine how we speak to the opposite gender whom we're interested in marriage. You're getting to know someone before the engagement, before the katbik tab. What are the guidelines that we have to observe to make sure that we are walking a proper moral path and that we are respecting the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's begin with the first half. In general, what are the Islamic guidelines when it comes to speaking to the opposite gender? We live in a society that makes it very difficult for us to observe the proper moral Islamic guidelines when it comes to interacting with the opposite gender. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us with different dimensions and desires. One of the strongest desires that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created in us is the desire for the opposite gender. Allah is the one who created this desire. Some people think this desire is from shaitan. If you were to ask random Muslims, where does this desire for the opposite gender come from? I will guarantee you at least half of them will tell you it's from shaitan, it's satanic. Allah is the one who created us. He created our tendencies, dispositions, our qualities, and all of our desires. Allah is the one who created us with those desires. Shaitan does not create a desire in you. Shaitan instigates you to misuse a desire. But he does not create that desire. Allah is the creator and the originator of these desires. But he has created us with different desires in order to give us the opportunity to be trained in this world. Have you seen people who are seeking a new job position that's very competitive, that's very hard, but it's rewarding. You get a lot of money from it. You go through training. That training makes you fit for the job. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this world, in dunya, He's training us to elevate spiritually so we can better experience life after death. So we can better experience the blessings He's given us in heaven, in paradise. Life is a beautiful training and Allah is your personal coach. He's your personal trainer. Now you will have to go through difficulty. No doubt about that. But that difficulty is part of the training. Without that difficulty, you don't really have a proper training. That's like someone who goes and pays a top dollar for a personal trainer at the gym. They charge a lot, right? How much do they charge? Does anyone know? They charge a lot of money. Now imagine one day you're excited to go to the gym. You've got a goal. You want to keep fit. 
you meet your personal trainer and your personal trainer tells you look I am such a good loving merciful personal trainer today I won't put you through any difficulty here I got you a pizza today and a nice movie let's watch would you accept that why not <laughs> maybe some of you would <laughs> why why would you not accept that you're like listen maybe I appreciate your good intention but that's not why I'm here I'm here so you make me suffer that's why I'm here because I have a goal I'm here for a five-hour good workout I don't want a pizza here a pizza here defeats the purpose but you know my dear brothers and sisters every single day that's what we expect from Allah Allah give me that pizza a nice movie I don't want to go through difficulty I don't want to be trained that's our philosophy with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah says but I care about you I'm your coach I'm your personal trainer maybe you don't know but I do know and I want the best for you so part of the difficulties that we experience is to have these desires but these desires are not there to make us suffer they are there to train us and elevate us so these desires come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the greatest challenge in this life is to manage these desires properly how do I channel them how do I how do I manage them and Allah gives us beautiful examples in the Holy Quran to teach us how do you manage these desires when it comes to the desire for the opposite gender Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us this beautiful story of Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam. Why is this so story so beautiful? Why does it always resonate with us? Why does it captivate our hearts? Because it speaks our reality. It reflects our challenges. Here you had the servant of God whom Allah had given vision. Allah had given him knowledge but Allah put him to the trial he was very handsome very beautiful probably the most handsome man Allah had created in that era and he ends up in the house of a woman who was also very beautiful and when he became a young man Ibn Abbas narrates this very interesting hadith he says for seven years Zulaikha would look at Yusuf and he'd lower his eyes he would not look at her in the eye after seven years she got frustrated and by the way she had bought him as a slave so she felt she owned him he has to listen to her because his brothers sold him as a slave to that caravan that was going to Egypt she told him Yusuf for seven years I speak to you and you lower your eyes look at me let me see your beautiful eyes he says Zulaikha if you were to see my eyes three days after I die and I'm put in the grave you would not want to see them he's reminding her of the consequences he's reminding her of death yes in this moment you're consumed with desires but just think about that don't be too materialistic don't fall in love with a body that body will decompose one day she tells him Yusuf but you smell so good he tells her oh if you would smell my corpse three day three days after I die you would run away from me he's describing that fate that awaits us all and then another interesting aspect of, of that predicament that he had with Zulaikha which shows you how a believer resorts to Allah in these moments so if you're familiar with the story of Prophet Yusuf السلام, she tries to lock him in her room and she invites him to immorality there is one report that mentions something interesting she locked all the doors seven doors she locked them so he could not escape one report mentions something very interesting the report states that she was an idol worshiper so there was an idol in her bedroom in her room so before she invited him to immorality and tried to force him she took a piece of cloth like a sheet and she covered the idol <laughs> Prophet Yusuf السلام, asked her what are you doing why are you covering the idol she's like well you know I'm kind of ashamed embarrassed 
to do what I want to do now, what I'm about to do, and, and the idol is, is here watching. So I wanted to cover the idol. Prophet Yusuf said, Subhanallah, your miserable idol, you can cover it when you want, but there's nothing that can cover my Lord from seeing and witnessing what we do. And then he runs away, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens the doors for him and he manages to escape. These beautiful lessons in the Holy Quran teach us how to manage our desires with the opposite gender. How to protect our purity and chastity. And so when it comes to the discussion of interacting with the opposite gender, speaking to the opposite gender, it's very important, my dear brothers and sisters, that we truly figure out what does Allah want from me. Not what society expects from me. Not what my friends tell me to do. Not what social media teaches me to do. Honestly, between me and my Lord, Allah created me, I'm here on earth. What does He really want from me? How does He want me to interact with the opposite gender? So when we discuss this very important point, we do have a few narrations from the Ahlul Bayt, from the Prophet and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, that shed light on interacting with the opposite gender. Now scholars have fallen into two groups in understanding these hadiths. The first group of scholars, they are somewhat conservative with their understanding. And then the second group of scholars, let's say they'll, they're a little bit more liberal. They have a slightly different interpretation to these hadiths. But I will share with you the hadiths. My dear brothers and sisters, you deserve to know what the Prophet and the Imams of Ahlul Bayt have communicated to us. The narrations that are attributed to them. And then we'll try to understand them and apply them. One hadith from the Prophet ﷺ states that a woman should not speak to other than her husband or someone who's related to her mahram more than five words. And those five words must be necessary. This is a hadith attributed to the Prophet ﷺ. I know you're already shocked, right? Now scholars have taken a hadith like this and they have two interpretations. The more conservative scholars, they take it literally. That literally this is what Allah wants for a healthy society. Only speak to the opposite gender who's not related to you if it's absolutely necessary. If it's not necessary, don't. This leads to negative consequences. Something that's necessary speaking to let's say a doctor for medical purposes, seeking advice from someone that you really trust because you really need that advice or learning. It's about pursuing knowledge and learning something purposeful and necessary. Anything that's not necessary should be avoided. The second group of scholars they say don't take five words, literally five words. It's just an expression from the Prophet ﷺ to teach people that just realize there are boundaries. Only if something is purposeful, you can discuss it with the opposite gender. But when it becomes aimless, there really is no purpose and you're just talking for the sake of talking. That's when you might end up in areas that you don't want to be. Because these harmless conversations can lead to many things. So always make sure that it's purposeful. There is a reason why I'm interacting with the opposite gender. And don't fool yourself between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Make sure that it is purposeful. So this is the interpretation of the second group of scholars. So yes, we do have pretty strict guidelines when it comes to interacting with the opposite gender, my dear brothers and sisters. This is something well established in our hadith literature. And there is a reason for that. My dear brothers and sisters, the reality is you can control if your heart is going to get attached to someone or not. You can control that. But once your heart starts to get attached to someone, you're not in control anymore. You cannot. 
the power of the heart is so powerful where you will be out of loss of control but you can control the steps that you took towards that many people many people you know they they start an affair that ruins their life simply because they did not observe these proper guidelines it was just normal casual conversations those conversations began to increase and increase become more frequent more frequent and they were not really purposeful next thing you know one or two two of them are severely attached to one another and many times that leads to a lot of pain to a lot of suffering to a lot of emotional damage Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware of what's good for us and what's harmful for us so that is the general guideline my dear brothers and sisters when it comes to interacting with the opposite gender it has to be purposeful now some people will say what's the harm it's just a word that you're saying it's just a conversation even if I'm sitting chatting with the opposite gender as long as my intention is pure what's the harm my dear brothers and sisters realize Allah owns us I don't own my body Allah owns me Allah owns everyone he has the greatest right over us Allah has said that if you want to get really comfortable with someone be very casual with someone that someone either has to be a relative mahram or there must be a marital contract your spouse other than that I have not authorized that this is the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now some people will say but if it's something bad or immoral you know then why would the marital contract contract flip that so what what's the big deal about the marital contract it makes a big difference huge difference I'll give you an example if today you step into a store there's no agreement transaction with the store owner you pick up an item and you leave what is that called stealing that's theft and what are the consequences of stealing yeah there's severe consequences you could go to jail you could get fined now take that same example you go in the store you don't even have money on you let's say you're not even paying for it that day you tell the store owner I'm buying this product I'll bring you the money tomorrow he says okay now you left now what do you call this buying and selling it's a sale it's just it's a transaction what's the difference what is the difference between the two you did the same thing you went into a store you picked up an item and you left if you look at it from the outside it's the same exact occurrence same exact event what is it that changed over here yes there is an agreement in the form of a transaction that's the key word there is a transaction between the buyer and the seller because there's a transaction it becomes legal it becomes okay even if you don't pay for it now it's okay you'll pay for it tomorrow but the point is you've got a transaction my dear brothers and sisters when it comes to interacting with the opposite gender when it comes to releasing the desires that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created for us that marital contract is extremely important it's a transaction between two parties under the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's extremely important because that transaction comes with rights it comes with rights when you enter that transaction you're responsible there are rights that you have to observe there are rights the other side has to observe now you're protected by these rights in the absence of this transaction what are the rights today in our society something that's very common is for someone to have a boyfriend or a girlfriend and they ask you what's the harm in that so what big deal no in the absence of that transaction what rights are protecting you emotionally psychologically physically you think when you say psychological and emotional words to someone there are no consequences today our youth our generation the teenagers they're free to say whatever they want to each other to express their emotions to one another and they don't realize the damage that could be done and then when one of them doesn't want to continue okay bye you can suffer for the rest of your life I don't care anymore and there are no rights to protect you Islam says no 
if you want to be emotionally intimate with someone, there must be a marital contract. It has to be your spouse. You can't just do this with anyone because there are no rights to protect that. It must be an official valid transaction. So generally speaking, when it comes to interacting with the opposite gender, my dear brothers and sisters, it must be purposeful. Between you and Allah, it's purposeful, it's professional, and there's nothing unnecessary about it. Just like a machine that does not have any unnecessary parts, <laughs> your conversations with the opposite gender should be like that. Every word is purposeful. There's a reason why you're speaking and interacting. And it's a good, noble goal. But when it comes to vain talk, that's where the shaitan is now very close to you. In one hadith, shaitan tells Prophet Nuh salam, I'm closest to the human being in three areas. Number one, when you're angry and you rage, you will make bad decisions. Number two, when you're judging between two people, you will be biased, so be careful. Number three, when you are privately interacting with the opposite gender. This doesn't just include like a physical private area. It also includes virtually interacting with the opposite gender. These days we think it's okay. We talk to one another, we chat privately, we sent the hearts and the roses and all those emojis. And every few days there's a new emoji to capture part of our heart. That is not okay, my dear brothers and sisters. Even if your intention is good, no one's doubting your intention. But that is not okay. If that person is not related to you, if that person is not your spouse, there is a limit. You don't have to express unnecessary emotions. Because doing that will lead to the formation of emotions for a lot of people. Just look at examples of these incidents in society. Your intention is good. But shaitan's intention is not good. Don't give him that opportunity. And you never know where your heart is going to lead you. So it's very important, my dear brothers and sisters, for us to understand this. Not see it as a restriction. I know the youth, they don't like this discussion. Come on, you scholars with this Islam and rulings and don't do this and don't do that. You're imprisoning us with all these laws. These laws are for your own goodness. These laws are to protect you from causing harm to yourself and harm to others. Psychological harm, emotional harm. That's really important. This is something that you, you can't really quantify. Can you go out there in society and sue someone for that? Can you go to a judge, hey, my girlfriend broke my heart. I would like to sue her for that so this doesn't happen again. No one's going to protect you from emotional damage, from psychological damage. Allah has put laws, if you observe them, you're much more likely to protect yourself and to protect everyone in society. So that is the first dimension. The second dimension that I would like to mention before we move on to the topic of specifically speaking to the opposite gender if you're interested in marriage, for marriage purposes. Another very important point to mention that our hadith have clarified is joking with the opposite gender. We live in a society where you have to be humorous, especially with the opposite gender. And you always have to break the ice by joking, right? And it's very normal. Our society does not see any problem with it. Yeah, that's completely okay. You're showing your humorous personality to the opposite gender, whether it's a classmate, it's a co-worker, doesn't matter, who cares? That's completely okay. And society rewards you for that and encourages you to do that. What is the problem with joking with the opposite gender? Any thoughts before, before I mention to you the hadiths and some scientific data here? Even, by the way, I'm not talking about inappropriate jokes. That's obvious. Even clean jokes. Being deliberately humorous with the opposite gender. What's the problem with that? Yes, sister in the back. Was, did, did someone raise their hand? Yes. 
it could develop emotions over time that could lead to something else. Okay, so does humor have that effect? Okay, one could be attracted to the opposite gender's humor. What other concerns are there about that? Yes, sister. Misinterpreting intentions. Okay, so let's say someone is joking with the opposite gender. Normally, how does that happen? How are intentions misinterpreted? Could the other side, for instance, think the, the person who made the joke is leading them on to something? Possibly. So yes, sometimes it leads to the misinterpretation of intentions. And that's not good. Any other thoughts? Yes, sister. You start getting comfortable. When you joke with others, you get comfortable with them. And what's the problem if you get comfortable with them? Someone will tell you, okay, as long as your intention is pure, get comfortable with them. So what? What's the concern? Then you are pushed to take the next step. Yes, that's what ends up happening many times. Do we have any hadiths that prohibit us from joking with the opposite gender? Yes. There is one hadith from the Prophet in which he prohibits us from doing that. And there is another hadith from Al-Imam Al-Sadiq or Al-Imam Al-Baqir Abu Basir was one of the companions of Al-Imam Al-Baqir. He used to teach a lady to read the Quran and learn the Quran. Because he was educated by the Imam. So he used to teach her that. Abu Basir says one day, I joked with her, possibly after the class. I joked with her. He doesn't say exactly what he did. We don't know the type of the joke that he said to her or what some hadiths indicate he made a gesture. We don't know exactly what he did, but he joked with her. Abu Basir says, right after that, I came to see Imam al-Baqir As soon as I saw him, out of the blue, he told me, Abu Basir, what did you do with that woman? Abu Basir narrates this. He says, I felt so ashamed, I covered my face with my garment. Then the Imam says, okay, you know, just make sure you don't do that again. So many scholars, when you see their fatwa, when they say it's haram to joke with the opposite gender, this is one of the hadiths, which is a sahih, authentic hadith, that they've relied on in order to issue such rulings. Now, you may be looking at this from the 21st century. I'm like, come on, you know, this looks very backwards. So what? What's the big deal if you joke with the opposite gender as long as your intentions are pure? My dear brothers and sisters, just read the science behind humor and joking. Some scientists even say after doing all their studies about joking and humor, some of them say the quickest way to a person's heart is through humor. It's very effective. So many studies have revealed that, my dear brothers and sisters. That when you joke in the presence of the opposite gender, that has a quick, powerful impact on them. You start attracting their hearts. Feelings start to develop without you even noticing it initially. It leads to that. That's why we have so many problems in our society today. Today, the rates of infidelity in the U.S. is more than 40%. And I believe me, it's more than that. These are just the official statistics. Not everyone admits to that. Over 40%. Why? There are reasons behind that. One of them is our culture and society that tells you it's okay to get comfortable with the opposite gender. So what? It's not a big deal. No, it has consequences. Just be aware of these consequences when inter interacting with the opposite gender. So these are just two very important guidelines I wanted to share with you. As we now transition to the next part, which is very important, getting to know the opposite gender. Are there exceptions or the same guidelines apply? Do you have any questions or objections to these two guidelines? If you have any objections, please, with an open heart, I do welcome that. I know some of you may not agree with this or you may find this problematic or it makes life impractical for you living here in the West. Any objections or any questions about these two guidelines? Yes, sister.
Okay, that's a good question. Let's say you're in a family gathering. You have cousins who are married. And you're joking with them. Is that okay or not? My dear brothers and sisters, in Islamic law, cousins, sisters-in-law, brothers-in-law, they are not mahram. Once the Imam السلام, was asked by one of his companions, can I sit with my wife's sister and, you know, even see her without hijab or just be too comfortable with her? She's my sister-in-law. The Imam says no. In God's law, you're not, allowed, you're not allowed to do that. So he said to the Imam, then basically my wife's sister and just a, a, a woman who's a complete stranger, they're the same legally. The Imam said yes. Under law, they are the same. The laws of the opposite gender equally apply to her. You have to be considerate of Allah's law when it comes to this point. Same with cousins. Your cousins are not mahram to you. I know in some of our cultures, it's completely okay to hug your cousin. Believe me, people have said to me, people who are religious, like they're committed to their religion. Say, I'm not doing something haram. He's my cousin. Okay, he's your cousin. I appreciate that you have a good intention, but it's, it's haram. In God's law, you cannot hug your cousin. Joking with your cousin. If you're joking directly, like the joke is aimed at that particular person, that is haram. But let's say you're in a gathering where there, there are a lot of people and you're not directly joking at the non-mahram opposite gender. If you say it in an open session, okay, you know, we could say that you're not directly joking with the opposite gender, that would be okay. But even with those gatherings, my dear brothers and sisters, even with such gatherings, be careful. The only way for you to know why this is concerning is to see what happens. It's to look at consequences. You don't hear about everything that goes on in the community. You don't. But many times, very negative consequences happened because of such gatherings. You don't know where the shaitan is going to strike you, my dear brothers and sisters. We've heard too many stories. And the more you hear of such stories, the more you realize why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated these laws. And that is for the well-being of everyone. So I would still recommend for someone to be careful in those gatherings. But as long as the joke is not, you know, aimed at that particular person, if it's just, you know, in the session, that would be okay, generally speaking. Any other questions or any other objections? I want to hear an objection. Come on, no one here has an objection to anything I said. You all agree? Yes, brother. Ammu, can you describe to me the exact situation so we can see what the ruling is? What exactly is your fathering referred to? What's, what's happening at school? Okay, is it haram to go to a homecoming dance with your friends just for fun? What do you think is the ruling? If you, th if you think it's haram, raise your hand. MashaAllah, we're all ulama. If you think it's halal, raise your hand. <laughs> okay, I don't want to put you on, your, on the spot. If you have a friend who thinks it's halal, raise your hand. Okay, a, a few more hands here. <laughs> Ammu, in, the, in Islamic law, dancing is haram. That's very clear. Dancing is haram and going to see someone from the opposite gender dancing, especially if there's music, haram music being played, that would be haram. So my recommendation is to avoid going to such places. Even if there's pressure on you, I know there will be pressure on you. Your friends will probably mock you. They'll accuse you of being weird. It's okay. You have Allah with you. Allah appreciates what you do. Don't go to such places because such places, I'll ask you a question. You know Imam Ali gives us a beautiful 
internal compass to sometimes figure out what's halal and what's haram. Now I'm just modifying the example. Now I would ask you, Ammu, in that homecoming dance, dance, do you think, right, if someone were to theoretically ask you this question, do you think there are angels present there or more shayateen there? Which one would you say? Forget halal and haram right now. Shaitan? Okay. Why? Why is that the case? There's a lot of music. There's inappropriate dancing. There's inappropriate dress. You think all those people are dressed appropriately? Many times not. So you have the answer there. If you're ever stuck in a situation, is this good or bad? Is this halal or haram? Just ask yourself, do you think honestly there's angels there? Or there's shayateen there? That will give you the answer. Yes, brother. So you're not participating in the dance or in the activities. Can you just chill there on the side? Okay, what would make it haram? If you're not participating or doing anything. Number one, going to such a place is a way of supporting that activity. If you're not okay with an activity, you don't show up to a place. Socially, that's how people see it. If I were to see you, I meaning someone in the community, not necessarily me. If someone sees you there, like, okay, he's okay with that. He doesn't have a stance against that. And supporting something that is haram is haram. The Holy Quran states, don't support anything that's haram. Don't collaborate to strengthen anything that's haram. Going to a place like that in one way or, a, or another condones it, gives it some legitimacy. Even if you're just on the side. Because it's, it's the prom, it's the homecoming dance, that's the whole event. Yes, if you go to a restaurant, right, and you're sitting on the table, you're doing your own thing, you're not drinking, somebody else in a different corner is drinking. You're not supporting that haram. That has nothing to do with me because I'm going to the restaurant to eat. An example like that, a scenario like that would be okay. But for you to go to a program that's about dancing, that would be haram. Even if you're just on the side. Secondly, secondly, you think that you're going there, you're not part of it. The environment has negative energy that will impact your spirituality. Whenever you go to some place, my dear brothers and sisters, imagine the negative radiation, right? The spiritual radiation that's going to affect you. A place where Allah is being disobeyed. Why should I go there? Out of respect for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the one who's created you. He's been so generous with you. And imagine, and imagine this. I know this could be a little bit extreme or graphic to some of you, but Keep it in mind, it's really helpful. Inshallah, you all have a long life. But imagine if you were there and your time came and you passed away there. Is that how you want to pass away? Think about it. You never know when the angel of death is going to come. Definitely you don't want that to happen there. So stay away from these places. You never know when your time could come. You never know when something could happen. I know this is not conventional. This is not what the school system teaches you. This is not what, you're he what you'll hear on TikTok, trust me. But my dear brothers and sisters, that's the test of this life. That is the trial. We have to be more responsible with our lives to protect our purity. It's not easy. It's very difficult. In fact, one hadith says at the end of times, if you want to hold on to your religion, it will be like holding on charcoal, lit with fire. That's how difficult it will be. It will be difficult. But Allah appreciates the effort that you make. As long as you make the effort, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appreciates that. Let's now transition to the second part. You're interested in someone and you want to get to know them better. So is it okay to be comfortable with them? To exchange emotional words? To, to tell the other side that you love them? Or you want to be now humorous with them? Joke with them? Use pickup lines with them? Right? In order to gain their interest, like one of the brothers, you know, he wanted the halal pickup line. So he went to that sister and he told her, you are the reason why Allah made hijab wajib. 
<laughs> Can you use such pickup lines with the opposite gender? Even if your intention is to marry them, by the way, you're getting to know this person. I hope I didn't give anyone any ideas. Don't use that, please. <laughs> yes. Yes, going to a swimming pool that's mixed, even if it's in school, that is not appropriate, my dear brothers and sisters. So inshallah, maybe in the Q&A part, we can further expand on that. That is not appropriate. To swim with the opposite gender is haram. That environment is not an acceptable environment. If you're in school, ask yourself to be excused from that. And you can come to us. We'll write you a letter from an institution explaining the Islamic guidelines. And the, the schools usually comply with that. So now let's go back to this very important point. You're getting to know this person. Many times before the engagement, these days, my dear brothers and sisters, it's very common. Before the engagement, the guy and the girl, they're very comfortable with each other. They go out with each other. Their intention is good. No one's doubting their intention. They want to get married, right? But they get very comfortable with each other. According to Islamic law, is that permissible? Is that acceptable? I would like to share with you a few points over here. Number one, my dear brothers and sisters, in the absence of that engagement, the katb iktab, the aqid, in Allah's law, that person is still not mahram. Because they are not mahram, it doesn't mean I can now be too comfortable with them. Yes, you can keep the conversation strictly professional, appropriate. Maybe there are some things you'd like to discuss. You'd like to see how he or she thinks about life. What is their perspective on certain issues? There are some important questions you want to ask. But to get too comfortable, such that you're joking and you start crossing the boundaries, that is not okay in the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that could take away the barakah and the blessings from your future marriage. Because whenever you're not in Allah's obedience, you're in the obedience of shaitan. And you allow him to interfere in your life. I know this is difficult for many of us to digest, believe me. Because we live in a society that's structured very differently. Where it's completely normal to be very comfortable with the opposite gender. To express your, your full emotions to them before the katb iktab. Some people even go out. They hold hands before the katb iktab. Yeah, my intention is to get married soon. I will give you an example to show you why this is not okay. Normally here in this country, when do we have the elections? Which, which, which month? November. So let's say in November, you vote for a mayor. And that mayor wins. When does the mayor take office? Or the president who wins in November, when do they take office? January, right? So about two months later. About two months later, they will take office. Now if someone were to tell you, look, this person, this, you know, uh, this guy, he was voted. He was elected as president. He's now president-elect. He's mayor-elect. So why don't you let them? Have those duties and have them come to the office and issue orders before the inauguration. Can they do that? Can someone who's been elected as president go and issue presidential powers before January? Why not? The law does not allow it. You're not officially a president yet. You're a president-elect. We respect you. We even give you that secret service, whatever, protection. Yeah, when they get elected, they do give them presidential, you know, protection. But you're not the president. You have to come in on the day of inauguration. You have to take the oath. Officially, you become the president. Then you could issue your powers. Same for the mayor. My dear brothers and sisters, before the katpikta, before that, your, before that engagement, your spouses elect. I'm inventing that term. Right? You're not spouses yet in the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's very important for you to know the guidelines. I'm not telling you you can't speak to one another. But even then, keep it professional. 
Keep it purposeful. You're still not lawful to one another. You still don't have a transaction that will protect your rights legally and spiritually. So be aware. Be aware of that. Many of us are not aware of that, my dear brothers and sisters. And I know this is very difficult. We live in a society that makes it very difficult to stick to these points. But it is possible. I do know youth in our community who observe these guidelines. And Alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed them with the most beautiful marriages. It's not easy. It's very difficult. But it is manageable. It is possible. Try your best for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You'll see how much barakah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put in that, you know, future marriage, in that relationship. Yes, brother. Okay, that's something we will examine in the upcoming weeks. You know, how to make sure that this person is compatible with you. What should you look for? So inshallah, we'll have an in-depth discussion on that in the upcoming weeks. So now we're just focusing on speaking to the opposite gender for the sake of marriage. That's the first point to keep in mind. The second point. My dear brothers and sisters, there's a problem that we have in trying to get to know to the opposite gender. We'll spend a lot of time. A lot of youth spend a lot of time speaking to each other. Many times without the knowledge of their families. Sometimes even with the knowledge of their families. They spent months, six years, a year. I know cases of two years where they're constantly in touch with one another. And they still have not had the engagement. And then when you ask them, why are you prolonging this, you know, period? Six months, a year, two years, you're so comfortable to one, with one another. You're spending all this time speaking to each other. What's the purpose behind that? One common response that you get is that I want to get to know her. I want to get to know him. Let me share with you some advice about that. And you can just ask people who went through this. My dear brothers and sisters, when you talk to the opposite gender, you're interested in that person. That person is interested in you. Both of you become professional actors. I guarantee you. If I know someone's interested in me, you think I will show my true personality? For a lot of people, for some maybe. I'm not saying this applies to 100% of the people. But to most people, this is the reality. I'll put an act. I'll show you my good side. The sweet side. You're not going to see the disturbing side of my personality. Or some of the other qualities that are not so positive and not so good. And that is why today, you see right after the engagement, right after the wedding, you have problems. Once a couple came for counseling, just months after their wedding, months. Not years, months. And you know what the guy said? He told me, Sayyid, she changed overnight. Wallahi, she changed overnight. Before the wedding, she was a completely different person. After the wedding, she became a completely different person. I told him, look, look, nobody changes overnight. Humans don't just change overnight. I'll tell you what was going on. Before the wedding, you were acting. She was acting. You were blind. You did not see that aspect. Now that the wedding has happened, you moved in, she's comfortable. She's showing you all of her personality. And that's what's disturbing you. You are blind. That's the problem. It's not that she just changed overnight. People do not change overnight like that. And the person's shocked. And I asked him, how long have you known each other before the wedding? Even before the engagement. The person said, two years. I said, wow, two years you've been talking to each other and you never that, saw that side. She's like, no, Sayyid. Well, I never saw that side. Obviously, when you have those glasses on, the love glasses, you're not going to see that other side. It's obvious. It's human nature. So my dear brothers and sisters, there is no point in spending a lot of time talking with the opposite gender for the purpose of marriage. The best recommendation is do your research. If you've done your research well, you've asked about this family, about this person, check their social media, ask some friends who know them indirectly. You don't have to go and yourself ask. Do some research. 
if you've done proper research and you've come to the conclusion that this person is good, you can give yourself some time to get to know them. I honestly would not recommend that you spend more than two weeks, maximum a month talking to each other. If there are really pressing questions you need to ask them, you need to see how they think about certain issues that will affect your future. That's more than enough. Two weeks is more than enough. After two weeks, don't drag it. I've seen so many cases of people who have come, they're broken. Why? What's the problem? Sayyid, he agreed to marry me. And we were talking for six months, for a year. I fell in love with him. I fell in love with her. And then they decided to walk away. And by the way, out of experience, the more this period is dragged and drawn out, the more problems happen before marriage. And that just sets a negative platform for marriage. There is no reason that someone, usually someone, to speak for too long. Now there may be some special cases. I'm not saying this applies to every person. People have different circumstances. I respect that. But for most people, it's not necessary. You've done your research. You've allowed yourself to sit a few times with this person. You've spoken to them. You kind of have an understanding of their mentality, of their personality. And it seems to match the research that you've done. Go like a man through the front door and propose. Don't keep dragging it for months and months and months. I know it's intimidating. Many guys tell me, say it's intimidating. You want me just to go and, you know, officially propose? Be strong, be a man. And they will appreciate that. A few years ago, one brother from our community, he had this dilemma. So he was interested in a sister. and You know, he had done some research. Everything looked well. He had spoken to her a little bit. Everything was fine. He's like, what do I do now? Should I, you know, keep talking to her for maybe in the next year and then slowly we'll get the family involved? I told him, do you really want my advice? He's like, say it. I'll do anything you'll tell me. I trust, I'm going to trust your advice. I'm like, okay, if you really want my advice, tomorrow go through the front door like a man and officially propose. He's like, are you sure? I'm too intimidated to do that. What if they reject me? What if, what if, what if? I told him, just trust me, go. Initially, they might hesitate. But when the father, when the mother and the girl herself, when they realize that you came respectfully and officially to propose they will respect you for that the parents will know you're not here to fool around because if you wanted to fool around you had other avenues to do that now that you've come respectfully to the family believe me they will appreciate that and that's exactly what he did the next day he went through the front door it was maybe a difficult conversation because you know the parents it takes time for them to get convinced but in the end, they appreciated what he did so much. They accepted. And just a few months after that, he invited me to go and do his engagement for him. It does work, my dear brothers and sisters. I know that's not what Hollywood teaches you. But forget Hollywood. You think they know anything about life? They know more, more about the destruction of life than the building of life. They're very good at that. And you can just see the life of these actors, mashallah. Very good examples for us, right? I know this is unconventional. Today you learn that if you want to get married, first of all, you need years of experimentation. Experiment for, a f you know, several years, 5, 10 years. And then when you're 25, 30 and you've uh, navigated all these waters, then you can try to, you know, settle down and establish a life. That's not the vision that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has for us. And then society tells you, yes, you need a lot of time to really get to know this person. That is not an effective way. As long as you've done your research properly and you've given yourself some time to speak to the person to see if the interest is really there, leave it at that. Now some people tell me the following. I will share with you this final very important scenario. Many people reach out to me and they told me that we are interested in marrying each other. But we practically cannot get married now. Many times... Young, young, you know, people, young youth, they ask me this. She's, you know, 18, he's 20. 
and they say our parents impossible they'll let us getting get married now we've tried everything they're just not convinced what do we do practically I will not be able to get married in the next four years but we love each other we'd like to stay in touch with it, with each other is that okay my honest advice is if you cannot get married practically within the foreseeable future within the very immediate future cut all communication that's not healthy for you it's not healthy for the other side if you can't get married from now till four years there's no reason why you should be in touch during these four years four years from now when you can revisit the case revisit the situation you don't know how many failed relationships how much suffering emotional pain has happened because of situations like these where they're talking to each other the attachment is very strong they have feelings for each other three four years after three years one of them changes their mind do you know how often that happens or maybe the parents say no for whatever reason some parents you know they're justified some parents are illogical I agree for you know reasons that are not justified they reject and then they're left broken after all these four years of that emotional attachment now you walk away that breaks you sometimes for life you don't want that in your life my dear brothers and sisters if you cannot get married in the foreseeable future you don't need to stay in touch with each other when you can revisit it and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you those blessings so that is my recommendation my dear brothers and sisters based on what we have from the hadiths and the legacy of Ahlul Bayt peace be upon them I know it's very difficult to implement a lot of this but at least make the effort Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will support you and Allah will put the barakah in your married life so now we'll open the floor to our Q&A session if you have any questions and as I said if you have any objections if this doesn't make any sense you're opposed to this this is impractical I would like to hear your thoughts yes brother so how do you do that research one example we can learn from Imam Ali السلام, is the following when Imam Ali السلام, wanted to marry Umm al -Banin, this is after the martyrdom of Lady Fatima alayhi salam. What did he do? Does anyone know how Imam Ali alayhi salam got to know Umm al-Banin? Now remember the Imam has the knowledge from Allah. He can ask Allah and Allah can show him who's good for him. But the Imam is an example. He wants to teach us. How did he get to know Umm al-Banin? Does anyone know? Yes sister. He went to his brother Aqil. And why his brother Aqil? Uh, Aqil at that time was an expert on families tribes their qualities and ancestry he was an expert in that so the Imam goes to Aqil and he tells him you're an expert in that find me a family who has these qualities that I want introduce me to them and he comes to the Imam he's like this is the best family out there that I know they have all these noble qualities the Imam السلام, proposes and they accept and Umm al-Banin joins the house of Amir al-Mu'mineen what you learn from that is to go to an expert let's say there's a person you have some initial interest in them you want to research about them go and ask someone in the community who's active who's well connected with the families and tell them look I need your advice I am interested in this particular person or this family can you help me do research about this family I don't know much about them I don't know much about her but I trust you so you have to go to someone trusted and someone who's knowledgeable like Aqeed someone who's experienced go to them and ask them we have many people who are active in the community they're well connected with so many different families it's okay to go to them don't feel intimidated tell them I have good intentions I've come to you because I know you're a trusted person in the community and you're well connected you're very active with a lot of programs you know a lot of families so can you help me research about this person this is one reliable way to go about that uh, yes I saw another yes sister <laughs> you opened Pandora's box what about the weddings right 
I'll be honest, a lot of the weddings that go on are not halal weddings. I mean, I can't sugarcoat things for you. I'm responsible before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some scholars have said if it's a female only gathering and there's no haram music, the women can dance amongst themselves. There are scholars who have said that. But if it's a mixed wedding where men and women are present, dancing is strictly haram. And according to most scholars, the vast majority of scholars, even the Debka, yes, even the Debka, they consider that as a type of dancing. Doing that in the, op in the presence of the opposite gender, that's haram. I know in many weddings, it's very normal. The men and the women, they're dancing, you know, at the end of that wedding, and the music is on, and there's the DJ there. That is haram. That is haram. Now, Someone will tell me, say it, but my relatives is getting married. If I don't show up, they'll take it as an insult. My recommendation is go to that wedding. Show your presence, congratulate them. Give them the nu'ta, the gift, whatever you want to call it. And then when that crazy part starts, leave. It's okay. You're not forced to stay at the end, till the end. You can leave, you can walk away until, you know, the party is over. You can step back inside or just leave. If you do that, Allah appreciates that, my dear brothers and sisters. Allah truly appreciates that from you. So yes, thank you for that question. That is a, a struggle. Uh, yes, sister. Okay, that's a very good question. If we have relatively strict guidelines when it comes to getting to know the opposite gender, interacting with them, how do you grow interest for someone? You want to genuinely have interest in their personality, in their character. But how do you have the opportunity to grow that interest? That's a very good question. Before I share with you my perspective, let me hear from you. What do you think? The sister has asked a very good question. It's a big challenge. How do you grow interest if you just have to keep, keep everything strictly professional? Yes, sister. Okay, so ask around, see how they interact with other people. Would that allow you to grow interest in them? It tells you a little bit more about them. Okay, so one, one key point here if we want to expand on it. My dear brothers and sisters, there's two types of interest in someone. There's intellectual interest and there's just pure emotional interest. The chemistry, let's call it. Try to grow intellectual interest with someone. That's much more stable, much more long-lasting. And you can do that through the research. By observing the person. You can also observe that person in an appropriate setting, right? You can observe a lot of people. How they talk, how they walk, how they behave, how they carry themselves. That says a lot about a person. It could be a, an official program. It could be a family event. It could be whatever. Even if you went to a wedding, right? <laughs> I know that's not the best place. But even if you're at a wedding, and you're really interested in getting married, pay attention. How is that person behaving at that wedding? It says a lot about their personality, trust me. It could be at a retreat where you're appropriately observing. When you spend two, three days in an environment, you see someone, you can get to know their personality a little bit more. Grow intellectual interest. Once you ask others who know them, and you know that this person has these good qualities, intellectually be interested in those qualities. So, so that is one point. Any other ideas? This is a very good question. What other solutions do you guys have? Yes, sister.
Okay, that's a very excellent observation here. Thank you for that. Any any other thoughts? Yes. So first work on yourself, reach that fulfillment and then, you know, consider that relationship. Yes, that's something inshallah in the upcoming weeks we will talk about that. When we talk about what qualities to look for, it's very important that you yourself, you have achieved an important milestone. And that could even facilitate the idea of, of you know, gaining more interest. Any, any other solutions? Look, this is an important, it's, it's an important dilemma. If, if there are strict guidelines, how am I going to find interest in that person? You need that initial interest to take that next step, right? So what's the solution here? No solution? We're doomed? <laughs> yes, brother. Okay, so they can help in introducing one to, to a good family, let's say, or to a good, op, you know, potential spouse, or helping you, like, create that interest. What, what can they help you with? Okay, that's a very good observation. Absolutely. That's the biggest challenge for our youth. Unfortunately, we don't have halal, you know, venues, programs to give them the opportunity to appropriately, appropriately know the opposite gender. I agree with you. And we should do more. And inshallah, we will. If you have any ideas and if you'd like to collaborate, we always welcome suggestions and, uh, you know, to find appropriate ways for that. So, so yes, I, I do respect that suggestion. Let me ask you a question before I move on to two more questions, inshallah, before we end the discussion. Let me, let me ask you this question now, just to shed some light on what the sister asked. Right now, look at the life of your parents. Now, so we don't make it, you know, too personal. The, fr the parents of your friends. <laughs> the parents of your friends who maybe got to know each other the more traditional way, right? where they probably fell in love after the engagement, not really so before. Look at those types of parents. Your friends who have such parents, do you know any such parents who have a happy married life now? If you do, raise your hand. You know, friends that you have, they have parents maybe from the older generation and they have a good, I'm not saying the perfect married life, but alhamdulillah they have a successful married life. And it's not, you know, the way that is happening in our generation where you fall in love and then after that becomes the cut biktab and everything. No, it was the other way around. Do you know any such parents that your friends have? Raise your hands. Okay. I see a lot of hands. A lot of you probably know such parents. Now, do you know parents that are maybe closer to your age in your generation who just recently got married, let's say in the last five to ten years? How many, do you, do you know parents like that who, who have a successful marriage now? Raise your hand if you know people like that. Okay, I still see hands. Now here's the question that I want to ask you. On average, on average, do you think your parents' generation have a more successful marriage than the generation of youth your age getting married? If you believe that your parents' generation have a more successful marriage, raise your hand. Ooh, 
I didn't expect that many hands. What does that tell you? And I'm telling you, a lot of these parents, it's not like they fell in love with each other before the Ketbik Tab. There was maybe a little bit of interest, but then they had their Ketbik Tab, they got married. And as you all admitted, Alhamdulillah, they have a stable marriage now. So what does that tell you? So right now, I just did an experiment with you guys. Who's a good analyst here? Who can analyze that? Do you want to take a shot at it, brother? You're a, you're a good data um, analyst. <laughs> how, how would you explain that? Or what kind of conclusion can you draw? Different world, simpler time. But what does this tell you about the process of doing research? Maybe your family recommends to you someone, your mother recommends to you someone, and then you get married. It's not an arranged marriage, right? It was consensual, of course, but it was semi-arranged. Meaning your family members told you, okay, this person's good, go and propose. And you did the proposal and then later Allah put that love in your marriage. What does that tell you about that part? It's something that you should consider, my dear brothers and sisters. I know it's unconventional, but believe me, it works. Go to your mother. Ask her mother. You know a lot of people in the community. Do you have any recommendations for me? That's a great place to start. I know that's not what Hollywood teaches you. They'll laugh at that. You crazy? Going to your mom to introduce someone to you? But that's how your mom probably got married. And most of you said, relatively, that generation has a better marriage. Look at it from this lens. Always analyze what's happening in the community. That will give you a very good sense of direction. So go to your mother. Ask her, how did you get married? How did you meet dad? The other family members that we have, the other friends from the older generation, how did they meet each other? That's a place to start. At least that's a place to start. And then do some more research. And then, you know, try to have more interest developing. And then have tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says in Surah Al-Rum, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who's created partners from your own selves, mates, so you can find tranquility in them. وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put love and compassion between them. And that is after the engagement. That is the real love, my dear brothers and sisters, that Allah will put in your marriage. If you enter the marriage with an open heart, with humbleness. My dear brothers and sisters, we are out of time. So I know you still had some more questions. Maybe after the program, I'll stay around to inshallah answer them. But thank you for participating in our program tonight. I would like to offer to you my condolences on the martyrdom of Al-Imam Ali al-Hadi. Tonight marks the martyrdom of Al-Imam al-Hadi salawatullahi alayhi, the 10th Imam of Ahl al-Bayt. And so I extend to you my condolences on this occasion. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the ziyara and the shafa'a of Al-Imam al-Hadi salawatullahi alayhi. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.